Welcome, everybody, to Bridging Tech, the SoCal Tech Bridge podcast. On today's podcast, our host, Chris Cicci, will be talking with SoCal Tech Bridge director, Captain Ben Cohen, about emerging technologies, sustainability, and the past, present, and future of the SoCal Tech Bridge. So without further delay, let's hop into the show. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to your Tech Talk. Um, to start off with, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what's your background, and you know, what led up to you being selected as the new director of the SoCal Tech Bridge? Yeah, thanks, Chris, and I really appreciate your time today putting this together. Uh, so, uh, I'm Ben Cohen. Uh, I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2005, coming out of Washington State. And uh, very fortunately, I spent some time uh, in the uh, Marine Corps' ground combat elements, uh, the infantry, and then the uh, force reconnaissance community. Uh, and I had a chance to grow up under some pretty incredible leaders there, which has, has shaped my understanding of how to proceed forward with the leaders I have now. And uh, so in 2013, I was selected for the uh, uh, Marine Corps uh, Enlisted Commissioning Program uh, called MISA. And I did my undergraduate program in Charleston, South Carolina, at the Citadel. Uh, I'm compelled to say that I was not a cadet was still an active duty Marine while there. The, uh, <laughs> the cadets who did graduate did, uh, have an interesting response to, to that sometimes. And um, so the, uh, the, the transition to officer uh, was pretty, pretty phenomenal. Um, and I was uh, selected as an infantry officer uh, uh, initially, and then uh, switched that to logistics. Uh, and uh, so I did my first tour with an infantry battalion uh, in Camp Pendleton, um, and then uh, was picked up uh, for the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and at the time, I, I didn't even know we had uh, a Naval Postgraduate School, or NPS as we call it. I was completely unaware of what it was or why it might be important. Um, it was not really on my list of things. And so uh, being selected and sent to Monterey, California was very much a surprise. Uh, and it was really my time at Naval Postgrad that, that was pretty formative. Um, so I was initially selected for the Defense Systems Analysis Program, which is commonly seen as the little brother to operations research. So we get a good balance of uh, modeling, simulation analysis, uh, and the acquisitions process for the US military and the federal government so that we can eventually become program and portfolio managers at, at various places around headquarters Marine Corps. Uh, that wasn't really my cup of tea. Uh, I didn't really enjoy staring at spreadsheets or, or diving into the the, uh, the acquisitions process, uh, but was, was happy to be in Monterey. Uh, but what's really interesting about Naval Postgrad is amongst the 1,600 officer students that are there and the faculty and staff, there's a really incredible array of uh, variety of thinking, diversity of um, understanding. Uh, you know, there are joint nation and partner nation entities there. Uh, so I had this phenomenal opportunity to explore and be surrounded uh, by really, really phenomenal, uh, incredibly intelligent, very talented individuals. Uh, and I had to, the opportunity to really dive into the joint perspective uh, of the U.S. military and how we engage with our partner nations. And so uh, when I arrived at, at Naval Postgrad, it was uh, June of 2020. So we were just, just starting with uh, the COVID madness. And so we started remotely uh, and I took that as an opportunity to go wander the school uh, and basically walked into every room that wasn't locked to see what else was going on in the school. <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot about the other programs at NPS just by opening doors and being aware that things were there and occasionally bumping into people. Um, only got scolded once or twice for wandering around, uh, but uh, had this really, you know, really great opportunity to understand like the really vast array of cool, amazing things that are happening there. Uh, and in that, in that vein, um, I stumbled into two professors um, who were uh, finalizing the curriculum for what was called the Applied Design for Innovation uh, Master's Program. Uh, and I said, that looks really awesome. Uh, you know, a design thinking or designer's approach to the DOD's innovation ecosystem, which I knew nothing about at the time, but was sort of aware that it existed. Uh, but the, the opportunity to explore that a bit more, that was what really appealed to me. It, it definitely uh, resonated with me much more than anything I'd experienced in the past. And so I, I applied for that, that program. It was the, um, the first um, 
uh, official cohort for that program and the first Marine in that program, which was really cool because they welcomed me with open arms uh, and uh, was able to explore some really incredible things and meet some even more amazing folks through that program. And what I was really struck by was the leadership uh, and the mentorship that I experienced and was afforded uh, through both programs, but really the Applied Design for Innovation track just, just gave me so much. Um, and so because of that, uh, the dual program um, for both defense systems analysis and applied design for innovation, I was able to make the case to uh, Manpower and Reserve Affairs at Headquarters Marine Corps that I go take over the Southern California Tech Bridge or the SoCal Tech Bridge for Naval X uh, instead of going to uh, Headquarters Marine Corps uh, programs and resources. And uh, I was just kind of like fortunate to be right place, right time, right folks. Uh, and uh, I had known the previous directors of the SoCal Tech Bridge, uh, Brandon Newell and Steve Harvey, who had been friends and mentors to me prior to going to NPS. And so I made the case that, hey, I've, I've been given this, this other degree. I'm, I'm learning this really amazing skill set. I'm building an incredible network. I think I can do more good for the Marine Corps if you let me go to this very weird, very uh, nebulous, very undefined billet uh, and try to explore emerging technologies uh, and the uh, impact that they will have on our warfighting force and how we need to understand the culture uh, of the, the warfighters uh, and our DOD leadership uh, to to increase the likelihood of adoption for these capabilities. So uh, that's kind of the, the quick backstory there, Chris. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a blessed career and been able to uh, meet a lot of great people along the way. Uh, now that you've been in the, the seat for a little while in the director's chair and kind of got your feet wet, what technologies are you most passionate about and, and, and why? Yeah, so uh, another phenomenal question and sort of a, a broad range uh, from my perspective. So I, um, I am interested in a lot of things uh, and I want to explore as many, as many technologies as I really can. Um, the, the ones that I am passionate about uh, could be important. Uh, and I'll get to those in just a moment. But I also was taught that there are ways of using technologies or capabilities that we just didn't consider before. And so uh, being able to explore these different technologies and capabilities uh, in a way that lets us uh, maybe redefine what they're actually uh, useful for from the military side of the house is, is really something that I'm uh, interested in as well. So um, my passions uh, are certainly in energy. I, I've always been interested. I'm, I'm not an engineer by trade. I don't speak the energy language well. So it's something that I am working really hard to understand a bit better than I currently do. Um, the exploration of renewable energy uh, and the emerging capabilities. Uh, so specifically in hydrogen electrolyzers, uh, hydrogen combustion, uh, wanting to explore what we can do with that in the future. Um, definitely interested in solar and wind and hydro. There are some really, really cool uh, advances in that. Uh, you know, we, we have a significant reliance on solar here in SoCal, so it's tough not to be a little interested in it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the look at the future, uh, small modular reactors, um, the, uh, the ability to look at macro and micro reactors uh, and how that may play into our ability to power the force of the future um is a big piece of this and on the other side which i consider also linked to energy uh, i'm very interested in sustainable agriculture uh, it has long been an interest and a passion of mine uh, to understand our food source where our food comes from uh, how we better manage uh, our food source and understanding the ripple effects or the uh, in other words the supply chain uh, the upstream and downstream effects of our supply chain when it comes to food and so uh, those are kind of like the two primary areas that, that I'm really passionate and interested in. Uh, but there are many other kind of smaller ones that, that I really want to drive into. And I think it would be important to note that in my passions, um, what I ultimately care about is that our, our warfighters, soldiers, sailors, Marines, uh, airmen, guardians, uh, all have an opportunity uh, to not only feel like they are valued assets to the military uh, and to what we do, but also uh, to contribute in a way that they didn't know was possible. And so I do believe that uh, even though these aren't you know, necessarily emerging technologies, I believe that the understanding of technology uh, and the opportunity to engage uh, with these emerging technologies is crucial. Uh, and that in and of itself 
is a, a pretty interesting skill set when you start talking about how culture and technology must be infused uh, for the future. Are there any technologies you think where the DOD is kind of missing the mark, they're overlooking something, uh, or not taking a particular technology seriously enough? Uh, so from my very limited very limited uh, and, and micro perspective in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think there are a couple that we, we could be capitalizing on. And I actually would go back to sustainable agriculture uh, as a technology that we sort of missed the mark on. We, the, the Marine Corps in particular actually did use uh, victory gardens uh, or hydroponic systems during World War II to support the island hopping campaigns. And unfortunately, there's not a lot written about that. It, it, it kind of was like secondhand information that, that sprouted up. But the ability to feed our warfighters is crucial and the ability to manage our food supply is even more crucial and so when i say that i think we missed the mark on that a little bit i think we missed the opportunity to recognize that sustainable agriculture controlled environment agriculture uh, can better contribute to the force as a whole and that contributes to physical health mental health uh, it contributes to morale in a lot of ways and anybody who's ever eaten one of our operational rations an mre or a, a tray rat can, can speak to that but I, I do think we kind of missed the boat on that. I think that if we had integrated sustainable agriculture early on as part of our installation resilience plan, and then as our as part of a forward deployed uh, sustainment plan, I think we would be you know, much, much further ahead. Uh, I think there's a lot of very positive ripple effects from doing that. And so uh, here at Miramar, we're very excited to start the Food Security Living Lab in conjunction with uh, Colonel Battelle, the commanding officer and the command staff here. We're extremely supportive of what we do. Uh, hoping that we can explore sustainable agriculture uh, for the future. Um, I would also say that we are putting a lot of time and energy uh, into uh, artificial intelligence moving forward. Um, I think that part of the challenge in artificial intelligence is we don't yet know exactly what it's capable of, but it's also mischaracterized pretty frequently. I mean, artificial intelligence is a very, very complex subject. It's, it's not so easy to say the computer algorithm learns that's not an accurate way to state that and, and unfortunately that's kind of the narrative that i run into for the most part and again keeping in mind that this is where i work in, in the southern california region and so a lot of the conversations outside of ai specialists that's what i run into a lot um, i think exploring the depth of what artificial intelligence can do for us is really powerful lately i've seen a lot of focus on artificial intelligence for uh, the common operational picture or closing the kill web or being able to better synchronize uh, a variety of uh, unmanned autonomous systems. And I think those are good applications. Where I think we really missed the mark early on with artificial intelligence was using it as a tool to better manage our policy and regulation. We have a lot of folks advising on the ethical use of artificial intelligence and its employment for tactical operations. And there's definitely uh, a need for that. But I would argue that at the same time, our artificial intelligence capabilities could help us better manage the rather extensive and robust policy regulation and doctrine process for the US military. So as a decision support tool for the very unattractive, you know, unsexy jobs, if you will, one of which is policy and regulation update, management, deconfliction, you know, artificial intelligence would be a very powerful tool there. Um, I, uh, I, I would close off by saying um, that where I think we might be missing the mark just, just a, a tiny bit, um, is in unmanned uh, aerial systems for uh, logistics. Again, we're starting to dive into this in a big way. Uh, we have, I think, become a bit bulkier uh, than we would prefer. Uh, and the Marine Corps is going through some very significant uh, and important changes now uh, as we look at, at how the force will fight itself in the future. And some of the other services are having the same conversations. Um, but the application of unmanned uh, X vehicles, whether it's air, ground, surface, or even subsurface, for logistics functions, I, I think we missed the mark on that as well. Uh, and I say that because logistics is the uh, is unfortunately generally an afterthought to many things. Uh, we are always focused on tactical application. We're focused on tactical execution, uh, and we want to get technologies in the hands of warfighters downrange quickly to make them more lethal and more capable. And I would argue uh, that we can be as lethal as we want, but if the bullets don't show up at the time that they're needed. Uh, our guys have nothing to put in their guns. Uh, and so I, I think that if we applied a bit more to the logistics side of this, and if we had given some direction to our commercial partners that uh, UXV uh, for logistics as an early priority would have set us off and we would have been able to then scale appropriately 
uh, to get to weapon systems. But I want to reiterate on all of these things that I, I think there is phenomenal work going on across the DOD right now. Uh, and my perspective, again, is fairly micro. So plenty to learn on my end. Those were three very, very timely, at least in my opinion, uh, you know, comments and subjects, uh, particularly as I, I believe as well that the DOD has kind of missed the mark uh, on those particular topic areas, but are quickly realizing the importance of, you know, the term contested logistics and, and how we're going to do uh, food security moving forward. You know, the, the big buzzword when I left headquarters Marine Corps was around what they were terming expeditionary foraging. So I think uh, uh, expanding on that idea of food security going forward through this living lab is a great idea for the DOD. Um, pivoting a little bit from there, uh, you know, some of your naval postgraduate work time was spent developing Project Vesta. Um, you know, what is it and what can you tell us about how it came to be? So Project Vesta uh, was actually born uh, not long after I arrived at, at NPS. Um, so the the complex fires, the three fires that started uh, in in North Central California that, that started as a result of a lightning storm and then combined into one massive fire uh, had an impact, um, obviously, on the people living uh, in, um, uh, in the peninsula area and to many others as well. Uh, our impact was fairly minimal compared to many others who suffered greatly. Uh, but I, I grew up in Washington State. Wildfire was a thing that was ever present. Um, you know, I actually tried to join uh, a smoke jumper crew uh, when I was younger before I got to the Marine Corps. Uh, apparently didn't have what it took at the time. Uh, but it's been present. It's been an interest of mine. And so I was having a conversation uh, actually uh, with Hannah Wallace uh, one day, who was previously a member of the Cana team and the SoCal Tech Bridge team, and she's greatly missed. Uh, but uh, I was having a conversation with Hannah about swarming. And we just sort of stumbled on the conversation of, you know, how would you swarm for, for wildfires? And that led me down this sort of interesting pathway of all these other things that, that could potentially be used for wildfire. And so I, I, sort, of, um, I sort of realized two things uh, as I was looking at the wildfire space. And, and again, knowing that I have no experience on the ground as, as a wildland firefighter or as a firefighter in general, and knowing very little about the process, protocol, procedures, and doctrine of our, our wildfire, wildfire crews, who I still think do a phenomenal job. Um, I, I walked away with two uh, sort of lessons learned. Um, the first one is that there are a lot of commercial off-the-shelf technologies or those that are very close to maturity that could impact this space, but we were not connecting the dots on those things um, terribly well. And understandably, because the fire community focuses on just the things it needs to do, just like the military communities focus on only their little slice of the fire or the operational picture. So one, there's you know all these commercial off-the-shelf technologies that, that could be put together, uh, but it hasn't really happened yet. And the second thing that I realized is that wildfire is the most constant, most dynamic, most dangerous enemy that I would argue that we currently face in the US. And initially, a lot of folks said, that's preposterous. Why would you say that? And I said, well, this is an enemy that does not sleep. It does not readjust its tactics. It does not have human emotion. And it is extremely complex for us to anticipate and respond to. And right now, it, we have given or I should say that the climate has changed to the point where it has a, a very, very large fuel supply. So this enemy that is so fantastically dynamic is one that we could learn a lot from. And I thought we could apply a lot of the lessons that we learn if we did start to integrate many of these commercial off the shelf technologies into a wildfire application uh, that we could then apply to warfighting. And I also remember very well uh, my days at Camp Pendleton where we would set the range on fire and that would not only cease training, but then those fires might spread. Uh, and more than once in my career, we've had to uh, outrun the flames at Pendleton uh, and get to, to places of safety. And so I thought, well, you know, the Marine Corps in particular, we love to set our base on fire on a regular. Uh, we could probably actually start testing a lot of these wildfire technologies in, in the military. Uh, on these military bases, which could then be applied and scaled to uh, the federal and, and commercial entities who are in this space. And I think as well that, that there's a lot of technologies we developed for the military that should have been applied to other commercial sectors. Uh, and there are a wide array, array of sensors. And by that, I mean uh, visual sensors, electro-optical sensors, infrared sensors, um, you know, chemical sniffers. There's a lot of different sensors that can be put in place 
uh, that can help us with this. But what we, we used those for warfighting application, they didn't get applied to others who might have needed it sooner. Uh, and so Project Vesta became my capstone project for my applied design for innovation track. Um, and I was very fortunate again to have great leaders who said, you know, this actually has a lot of value. We, this is, is pretty applicable. Let's go forward with that. And aside from being able to integrate the technologies, the other argument that I made that, that I felt was, was fairly important was um, with Vesta, uh, if you're able to stop wildfires, it's not just the cost of attacking a wildfire or being able to suppress a wildfire, but at least on the military side, it's the cost savings in lost training time. You know, an infantry battalion is expensive to keep around. Uh, and so if they can't train for two or three days because of a wildfire, that's taxpayer dollars just sitting there doing nothing. And it disrupts our training plans. It compresses our training cycle. It has significant effects and impacts. So the justification was, I think that we can do better with this. And so I, uh, through the National Security Innovation Network and through um, the SoCal Tech Bridge uh, Electric Mobility Symposium events in summer of 21, uh, I connected to eight commercial technology partners who had something that could be applied in the uh, wildfire space, whether that was unmanned uh, rolling battery packs like the Danner Mobile Power Station or parallel flight technologies, uh, Firefly and Serenity drone models that were you know, specifically being built for wild and firefighters or the Irene AI, Irene Artificial Intelligence, you know, fire detection algorithm built by um, a Berkeley grad, uh, Sukhmeet Singh. Uh, you know, there's really fantastic folks that I ran into. And so I pitched an idea to all of them and said, hey, if the military became the integrator, would you be interested in coming and trying to connect to our technologies? And they all said, yes, they were all very interested. Uh, and so there was, there was networking opportunities, there was exposure opportunities. Uh, and that resulted in in me being able to convince these wonderful partners to come to the joint interagency field experiment that's hosted by Naval Postgraduate School every quarter at Camp Roberts uh, National Guard Base just south of Monterey. And so, uh, you know, you were there. We had a really interesting week, a lot of good lessons learned um, and felt that the initial integration efforts, which were you know, very, uh, I, I would say, raw um and, and we went at it uh, aggressively and with um you know uh a, a lot of flexibility in how we were proceeding in those those days of testing and integration we walked away thinking hey i think we can actually proceed with this and so we then uh started to to lobby for funding uh and find better ways to support and so uh hopefully you know, project vesta will continue but the intent was uh, to look at the military serving as the integrator for uh, commercial off-the-shelf technologies that could be applied together to solve a wicked problem, and in this case, wildfire. And the hope is that uh, Vesta, if successful, when we begin testing this summer, uh, will also be able to uh, apply to disaster response in general, both for the military, commercial, and federal sectors. Yeah, Project Vesta was, uh, uh, at least to me, you know, as you mentioned, I was kind of involved in Project Vesta through throughout GIFIX. Uh, was a fascinating topic because it so much mirrored what the Marine Corps is looking at in terms of networks of sensors. You know, in the case of, uh, you know, the DOD, we're, we're more focused on detecting uh, bad, bad people and bad things uh, and then using a human machine teaming approach uh, to tackling that problem. You know, I think outside of just the goodness uh, of mitigating the problem that is wildfire, both for the DOD and for the commercial sector, there's so many lessons learned in how you do that human machine teaming, uh, how you can be complementary between the machines, between the AI technologies like Irene, um, with with what the overall service is trying to do. Um, so it definitely goes beyond just firefighting as far as the value uh, to the United States and to the Department of Defense. Um, now that you have been in the tech bridge for a little while and, and had a chance to kind of see it from the inside, what do you feel are some of the greatest assets and strengths of the tech bridges? And do you see anything particularly unique about the tech bridge here in Southern California? So uh, I do, uh, and I'm gonna go uh, right back to uh, one to, to your comments about uh, you, were, you were sort of involved with Vesta, which is a gross undersell. <laughs> you were intensely involved in Vesta and the work that we did there. And I think your comments there are right on the money because Vesta is such a wide array of opportunities and when we realized that, I mean, when you and I got to talking about it and, and with the rest of the SoCal Tech Bridge team got to talking about Vesta, we realized there were so many different fascinating areas that we could really jump into and explore. Um, and 
I, I bring that up because when I think about the strengths of the SoCal Tech Bridge, which is one of the sort of uh, legacy tech bridges, one of the first four that was stood up here in, in, for the for Naval X, the the strength of this is our people. It is everything to do with our people. Uh, I will always always want to keep people at the very center of what we do. You know, we build technologies for people uh, or to be. Uh, to interact with people in some way, whether friend or foe. Uh, we build technologies to make our lives easier. We build technologies to bring simplicity to complexity, uh, but it's all human centric. And so the first thing I will say is that the strength of the tech bridge is the people that my predecessors, uh, Brandon and Steve attracted to the tech bridge, uh, who have very graciously welcomed me into that network uh, and been friends and mentors to me uh, since before I officially took the helm uh, in, in um, June, uh, May or June, I've almost forgotten at this point. Um, but the, the the people is the very core. But I think a close second to that is that the operating model of the tech bridge is really powerful. Uh, and all credit to Brandon Newell for recognizing that the collaboration between uh, him as the director of the Naval Exo Caltech Bridge and NYWIC PAC particularly Ms. Marissa Brands and her agility and her next step program. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Joe Sanchez, who's a former Marine and, and a valued and trusted partner in a, in a lot of this, uh, they formulated the next step, next source, next strategy triangle or trifecta of looking at opportunities that we could unlock uh, in the Southern California region. And, and SoCal has so many different opportunities between industry, academia, other government organizations. I mean, there's so many things that we can explore and try to capture and bring in. But the model, the operating model that Brandon and Marissa uh, and Joe developed and refined and, and very graciously passed off to Stephen and me uh, is at the very core of how we have been able to successfully do some of the things that have been done. Uh, to date, I have not been able to, to, to stand and say, hey, we, you know, since I've taken the helm, this is what we've achieved and where we've gone. Hopefully, in the next uh, eight to 12 months, we'll be able to say that the, the food security living lab is up and running and uh, some of our other projects and electric vehicles and microgrid energy are, are able to move forward. Uh, and some of our continued work in 5G, the 5G living lab can become a reality. But that operating model is really, really powerful. And then the third thing that, that I would say uh, is that we are not afraid to fail. The tech bridge is not at all afraid to fail. We're not afraid to take ownership and accountability of that failure when it happens. Uh, and we welcome failure because we learn so much from it along the way. You know, I fail every day in some capacity or another. Uh, and I have learned through phenomenal mentors and friends through the Tech Bridge and yourself and Norm and Marissa uh, and Brandon and Steve and Joe uh, and, you know, again, Hannah, uh, but and even the new team members who have joined recently. Um, those who are engaged with and support the Tech Bridge are not afraid to recognize that, hey, this didn't work. We have to pivot, we have to switch, or we have to stop altogether. Uh, we are willing to take risks and listen to new ideas, and we can connect dots that I don't think that anybody else can. Uh, and so I am seeing those as, as our, as our you know, tremendous strengths, but it will always come back to people for me. Uh, and as we move forward with the Tech Bridge, uh, and my, uh, as the, the opportunities sort of materialize uh, over the next 12 months that I will hopefully be able to take and, and do with in the, in the preceding 24 months, um, excuse me, the following 24 months as I hope to stay in this billet for three years. Uh, I'm really excited to see how our non-traditional partnerships enabled through our operating model can really unlock some incredible opportunities for warfighters uh, to engage with emerging technology and figure out how to bring it into their culture and how to give feedback to our commercial and academic partners on what those end items need to look like, what those emerging technologies actually need to be, what the prototypes need to be for us to want to bring them on board and make us more capable and lethal down the road. So as we're kind of closing up here, because we're getting uh, a little bit close to time, I, I one wanted to give you uh, an opportunity to you know, provide any kind of comments or, or, or commentary you want, but uh, what I was really wondering is how do we as a tech bridge, you know, align and address with what the boots on the ground warfighter actually needs? Uh, and I would caveat that with um, a lot of times the perception is that R&D is happening, but nothing to use the big, you know, T word transitions, nothing actually ends up in the warfighter's hands. 
So, uh, you know, two parts. How do we ensure kind of alignment with what the warfighter wants? And, and how do we move the ball down the road so that eventually the great things that they're working on at the tech bridge end up in the hands of the warfighter? That's a great question, Chris. And so I, I think how I would respond to that is um, my approach to all of this is one that's an iterative design, meaning that what we think we might be able to do now, we intend to iterate on, improve on it as much as we can. But uh, my my passion, and I think really everybody on this team, their passion for getting technology into the hands of warfighters, but getting warfighters to inform uh, the the uh, technologies and their potential use cases along the way is is essential. Uh, so to that end, uh, the SoCal Tech Bridge is going to stand up an end user engagement program. And so by that, I mean, we will approach uh, battalion and squadron level units here on the West Coast between 1st Marine Expeditionary Force and 1st Marine uh, Air Wing. And we will ask them, what are your problems? What are your challenges? Where are you struggling? How can we help you? Uh, and we try to apply a, a holistic approach through design thinking to understand where the challenge or problem really is. And I think there's many cases in history of uh, us thinking that issue A is our real problem and then uh, realizing through a chain of exploration that issue D is actually the core issue, which has affected uh, A, B, and C along the way. And so my hope is that this end user engagement program, which is uh, designed to enable and empower warfighters and uh, battalion level, squadron level commanders and above uh, to hear some of the challenges that are being faced uh, and then connect those to potential projects that are underway at the many R&D organizations uh, across the DOD or within the DOD's ecosystem, or to connect them to commercial technologies that may help uh, and put the designers and the engineers and the developers of that particular program capability, technology, prototype into the room with the people who will eventually be the end users um, and create a collision of those folks being able to talk to each other. Now, I want to be clear, this is not necessarily requirements development, although the tech bridge does support requirements development for the projects that are funded for us. But this is user interface, it's end user design. You know, the, the adoption of certain technologies, even though driven by the requirements development process, still has a lot of impact when it actually gets into the hands of the warfighter. So we want to close that gap by exposing the warfighters to the work that's being done by breaking out the bubble just a little bit, you know, opening their aperture, letting them know there are ways to engage uh, and seek solutions or ask questions through the tech bridge or on their own. Uh, and we want to give those research partners an opportunity to engage directly and get to the warfighter uh, because they're building their product or capability for the warfighter. You know, most of those programs or concepts or uh, startups are, are focused on the, the end user. So we want to connect them better. Uh, and so we'll be, you know, going public with that uh, when we have it formally in place and, and all set and ready to go. We're excited about that. Um, and so that would be my first answer to you. Um, my second answer, uh, which to clarify, you were uh, you were asking about the requirements development piece of that. I want to make sure I get that one right. Much less the requirements development. It's, it was more of a question on how uh, we move the technological ball down the field and how do we pass that ball off to whether it's another research entity or whoever that may be. Uh, how are we kind of like smoothing the path for this technology if we didn't just reach failure um, for it to eventually end up in the warfighter's hands? Yeah, so that's a very tricky one. Uh, you know, a lot of good people are working on that problem. Uh, and I really hope that we can make a little bit of progress. It, it'll be more local. We will obviously be focused on on the SoCal community uh, of warfighters, both uh, Marine Corps and Navy. Uh, but we engage our stakeholders on the East Coast as frequently as possible. And that's everything from those under the Marine Corps uh, purview, uh, Mark Corps, uh, Marine Corps Systems Command or Combat Development uh, and Integration, uh, or uh, the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, those who are in a position to see the value of a technology and bring it forward. What I hope will drive that and smooth that process is one, uh, being able to support requirements development as an emerging technology is explored with, but two, is immediately and very frequently partnering emerging technologies to tactical level units so that the stakeholders and decision makers uh, who can support these programs and fight for us to get a long term uh, palm funding can, in fact, see how the end users are engaging with this technology and the value that it brings uh, and trying to reduce flash to bang time. So essentially, instead of 
first research and development and then requirements development taking place before a system is brought in. Uh, instead, research and development and requirements development happening in tandem, informed by tactical level interface with the actual technology or program. Um, I'm a firm believer that people have to touch or feel or see the thing you're talking about. PowerPoints don't cut it anymore. So the end user engagement program and the approach of the, the TechBridge operating model is going to be to get those folks into the same place at the same time to talk about the thing that matters. So we wanna get the thing to do the thing in front of the people who needed to do a thing. Uh, and uh, the hope is that that model uh, will yield some successes to smooth out that process so that the, the disconnect uh, that, that sometimes occurs between, uh, again, those decision makers and the stakeholders and, and the, um, the program officers uh, to the end users can, can be hopefully smooth and, and uh, shaved down just a little bit uh, if we can get away with it. No promises, but that's certainly what we want to try. Absolutely, and it sounds like a great approach to set everything up for success. Uh, with that, that, we're at our time. So first of all, I'd like to just thank you for taking time out to uh, speak to me today. And do you have any uh, parting words? I want to thank you for your time as well, Chris. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and uh, for those who are interested in engaging with the Tech Bridge or just curious, please reach out. We want to connect with you. We want to hear from you. Uh, active duty, industry, academia. You know, we want to know how we can make things better. And we want to do it as quickly and as smoothly and as accurately as possible. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Bridging Tech, the SoCal Tech Bridge podcast. A big thanks goes out to our host, Chris Cicci, and of course, our guest, Captain Ben Cohen, the director of the SoCal Tech Bridge. If you would like to hear more of the SoCal Tech Bridge or find out more about our operations, programs, in the future, the SoCal Tech Bridge, head on over to our website at SoCalTechBridge.org. While you're there, remember to sign up for our newsletter and like and subscribe. We'll catch you next time.